Well, coming up next on Book TV, Ben Carson presents his thoughts on America's current social and political landscape. Dr. Carson, Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions, examines the similarities between the United States and empires that declined. He also makes recommendations on what should be done to deter America from following the same path. This is about an hour, 15 minutes. Now let me just say that's more than a quarter of a century. I'm a little older than that. But uh, it's a real... Okay. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all uh, this evening. I've heard a lot about the Blackburn Institute and uh, the Nick's uh, lectureship, and I'm very honored to be uh, a part of this uh, distinguished group. I wanted to, uh, to talk a little bit this evening about some of the things that really shaped my own life and my own philosophy. You know, I was one of those people who kind of knew what I wanted to do from very early on. Medicine was always the thing that interested me. If there was ever a story on television uh, or on the radio about medicine, I was right there, just like a magnet. I even like going to the doctor's office. But, you know, the thing, the thing that really caught my attention was uh, church. You know, in uh, Sabbath school, they frequently had stories on about missionary doctors. And these were people who, at great personal expense, traveled all over the world to bring not only physical, but mental and spiritual healing to people. They seemed to me like the most noble people on the face of the earth. And I decided when I was eight years old that I was going to be a missionary doctor. And that was my dream until I was 13. <laughs> At which time, having grown up in dire poverty, I decided I'd rather be rich. So at that point, missionary doctor was out and psychiatrist was in. Now, I didn't know any psychiatrists, but on television, they seemed like rich people. You know, they drove Jaguars, lived in the big fancy mansions, big plush offices, and all they had to do was talk to crazy people all day. And, you know, it seemed like I was doing that anyway. So I said, you know, this is going to work out extremely well. And I started reading psychology today. I was the local shrink in the high school. Everybody brought me their problems. I would stroke my chin, say, tell me about your mama. And, uh, and then I even majored in, uh, in psychology in college, did advanced psych in medical school. I was gung-ho. I mean, I was going to be the world's greatest psychiatrist. And then I started meeting a bunch of psychiatrists. <laughs> Need I say more? Nah. I'm just kidding. Some of my best friends are psychiatrists. But what I discovered very quickly is that what psychiatrists do on television and what they do in real life are two very different things. And actually, what they do in real life is considerably more important than what they do on television. They're some of the more intellectual members of the medical community. But it just wasn't what I wanted to do. And I had to say, now, now what? And I said, well, what are you really, really good at? You see, I believe that God gives everybody special gifts. And I stopped and analyzed my own gifts. And I realized that I had a lot of eye-hand coordination. I was a very careful person, never knocked things over and said, oops, which is a good characteristic for a brain surgeon, by the way. Um, I could think and see in three dimensions, and I love to dissect things. That coupled with the love of the brain, I said, you would be a natural in neurosurgery. Now, some people thought that that was kind of a strange occupation for me because at that time there had only ever been eight black neurosurgeons in the world. But, you know, I never really stopped to think about things like that. I stopped and I thought about where do you fit? And it turned out to be a very excellent uh, choice for me. You know, I started out as an adult neurosurgeon, but I very quickly learned that no matter how good an operation you do on those chronic back pain patients, they never get any better until they get their settlement. Whereas, uh, <laughs> whereas with children, you know, what you see is what you get. You know, when they feel good, you know they feel good. When they feel bad, you know they feel bad. And, you know, here's the thing. 
you know, you can operate on a kid for 12, 14, 16 hours. And if you're successful, your reward may be 40, 50, 60 years of life. Whereas with an old geezer, you spend all that time operating and they die in five years of something else. So, you know, I'd like to get a big return on my investment. And uh, I'm just kidding, I like old people. But uh, actually, I'm one of them now. But, uh, and, and actually, a large part of my practice now involves a condition that affects primarily older people. It's called trigeminal neuralgia. Very, very painful condition of the face. Used to be called the suicide disease. The pain was so bad. And we have the ability to get rid of that pain. And I'll tell you, there is nothing like seeing somebody who had their life just turned upside down and to be able to do a procedure and all of a sudden they have their life back. And really, you know, that's what, what medicine is all about, being able to intervene at times like that and make a difference. Now, before I go any further, I want to take uh, just a brief moment for a disclaimer. You know, everybody makes disclaimers these days. Have you noticed that? You know, I belong to this board or, you know, I'm associated with this group and therefore you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Well, what I have noticed in recent years is that it's now virtually impossible to speak to a large group of people without offending someone. <laughs> have you noticed that? You know, when I was a kid, you know, they used to say, sticks and stones break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I don't think the kids know that anymore. They don't hear that phrase anymore. Because everybody walks around with their, show, with their feelings on their shoulders, waiting for somebody to say something. And then they can, oh, did you hear that? And then they can't hear anything else you say. I remember once I was talking to a group about the difference between a human brain and a dog's brain. And uh, a man got offended. He said, you can't talk about dogs like that. And then uh, another time I was talking to a group about how the fashion industry has gotten the young ladies to think they're supposed to be so skinny. They look like they escaped from a concentration camp. And a Jewish man got offended. He said, you can't mention concentration camps. That's way too sensitive. It would be as if I said something to you about slavery. I said, you can talk about slavery all you want. It doesn't bother me. But you know, some people just choose to get offended. So this is my disclaimer. It is not my intention to offend anyone here this evening. And if anyone is offended, too bad. Because uh, I've got to tell you, I don't really believe in political correctness. And in fact, I actually think it is a very destructive force that is in the process of ruining, ruining our nation. I talk about this a lot in my latest book, America the Beautiful. But Think about this. A lot of the people who founded this nation came here trying to escape from people who tried to tell you what you could think and what you could say. And here we are reintroducing it through the back door. Exactly the same thing. And it's absolutely absurd. And really, the emphasis should not be on unanimity of speech and unanimity of thought. The emphasis should be on learning how to be respectful of people with whom you disagree. And if we would begin to do that, then we could begin to have intelligent, rational dialogue. How can you have real dialogue when you can't even say what you believe? You can't even say what you mean. You have a necessarily artificial conversation. And our society is now full of artificial conversation. And it's one of the reasons that we are making very little progress. And it's something that I think people are going to have to get excited about once again. Recognizing that, you know, our society is changing quite dramatically right now. There is a very secular, segment that is trying to change the nature of our society. And they have employed political correctness as a means to mute discussion on what's being done. And the only way it can be combated is that people have to learn how to speak up. 
because there are few people with microphones and podiums who impose their will on the rest of people to the point that in this nation where all of our coins and all of our bills say in God we trust we are afraid to say Merry Christmas I mean how did that happen and the only way that kind of thing happens is when vast majority of people allow themselves to be controlled by a vocal minority you know you think back to Nazi Germany most of those people did not believe in what Hitler was doing but did they speak up? No. They kept their mouths shut. And you see what happened. We're in the process of watching a lot of things that characterize our greatness go down the tubes because of passivity. And when people start revving things up a little bit, like the Tea Party, they get labeled as anarchists and crazy people because there is an establishment consisting of Democrats and Republicans who want to maintain the status quo and want to maintain their power and to grow their power and to grow their intrusiveness and they won't want anybody to say anything about it. And that's really what's a lot of political correctness is all about. And you'll read about that in great detail in my newest book. But, you know, I had this tremendous dream of becoming a doctor, but there were problems along the way. Not the least of which was the fact that my parents got divorced early on. That was devastating. Some of you have been through that. You know what I'm talking about. If anybody out there is thinking about getting a divorce and you have children, please think about it again. Please ask yourself, wait a minute, am I being selfish? Because, you know, it's the same person that you loved and adored not too long ago. And most divorce is secondary to selfishness. People start thinking about themselves and not about the unit, not about the family, not about the child. Just a little food for thought. But at any rate, you know, my parents got divorced and, you know, in this particular case, my mother discovered that my father was a bigamist, had another family, so I don't think she really had a whole lot of choice there. She only had a third grade education and there she was faced with the prospect of raising two young sons in inner city Detroit with little money and little education. And we ended up moving to Boston to live with her older sister and brother-in-law in a typical tenement, boarded up windows and doors, sirens, gangs, murders. Both of my older cousins, who we loved, were killed. And I never expected to live to be beyond 25 years of age, because that's what I saw around me all the time. And there was never money for anything. You know, we would go to the store, and my brother and I would want some bubble gum or some jawbreakers and we would ask my mother if we could get them and of course the answer was always the same there was no money for that and she wanted to get it for us but you know the look of pain in her eyes was so great pretty soon we didn't even want to want to see that look in her eyes anymore but as difficult a life as she had and she worked two to three jobs at a time as a domestic, cleaning other people's houses because she didn't want to be on welfare. Even though she had only a third grade education, she was very observant. And she noticed that no one she ever saw go on welfare came off of it. So she just said, I don't want to go on it. I don't care how hard and how long I have to work. But as difficult as her life was, she never adopted what I call the victim's mentality. She never felt sorry for herself. And I think that was a good thing. Problem was, she never felt sorry for us either. <laughs> so, you know, there was never any excuse that we could give that was adequate. She would just say, do you have a brain? 
And if the answer was yes, then you could have thought your way out of it. It really doesn't matter what John or Susan or Mary or David or anybody else did or said. And you know, the interesting thing is, when people won't accept your excuses, pretty soon you stop looking for excuses and you start looking for ways to get things done. And I think that was perhaps the most important thing that my mother did for both my brother Curtis and I. And I think also, you know, the poverty, the hardship that we faced was not such a bad thing because we were we had each other, we were happy, even though we were very poor. And I, don't, I really don't think money brings happiness. It's, you know, purpose and family. And, um, you know, thinking about others. Those are the kinds of things that bring contentment and happiness. And people who focus their desires upon material things are destined to be disappointed in the long run. And, you know, I told my three sons as they were growing up that they were much more disadvantaged than I was because, see, they've gotten to travel all over the world, do things, they've never had any need for anything. And uh, I'm not sure that that's healthy, so my wife and I tried to create artificial hardship for them in order to harden them up and make them ready for the world. And uh, I think it actually worked out uh, pretty well. Uh, one of them's an engineer. One of them's a vice president of a wealth management firm. And uh, one of them's an accountant. Nobody wanted to go into medicine, though. They all thought that I worked too hard. But uh, it was OK as long as they become productive uh, members of society. And that was really our goal for them. But at any rate, you know, as a fifth grader, I was not doing particularly well in school. And I think we may, do we have any fifth graders here today? Oh yeah, okay. But, but you guys look intelligent. You guys look like you're doing very well in school. I was terrible. In fact, my nickname was Dummy. And uh, all the other kids liked having me in the class because I was what's known as the safety net. You never had to worry about getting the lowest grade on a test as long as I was there. And, uh, but I, I remember uh, we were once having a, an argument about who was the dumbest kid in the school. And it wasn't a big argument. They all agreed it was me. But then someone tried to extend the argument to who was the dumbest person in the world. And I said, wait a minute. I said, there are billions of people in the world. And they said, yep and you're the dumbest one. Well, to add insult to injury, that day we had a math quiz. And you had to pass your paper to the person behind you. They would correct it, give it back to you. Teacher would call your name out loud, and you had to report your score out loud. Not a problem if you got 100 or 95. Major problem if you got a zero and just had an argument about who was the dumbest person in the world. And I said, oh boy, they're just going to laugh hysterically when I say that. So I started scheming. I said, I know what I'll do. I said, when she calls my name, I'll mumble. And the teacher will think I said one thing, and the girl behind me will think I said something else. So when she called my name, I said, nah. And instead of writing it down, she said, nine. Benjamin, you got nine right. Oh, this is wonderful. I knew you could do it if you just applied yourself. Class, I want you to understand the significance of this. Benjamin has got nine right. If he can do it, anybody can. It had 30 questions. But she just kept ranting and raving. And finally, the girl behind me couldn't stand it anymore. And she stood up and said, he said none. Well, of course, they were just rolling in the aisles. And if I could have just disappeared into thin air, never to be heard from in the history of the world, I would gladly have done so. But I couldn't. So I had to sit there and act like it didn't bother me. But it did. It bothered me a lot. Not enough to make me study, but it bothered me a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was just one of those kinds of kids. But, you know, unfortunately, there are a lot of those kinds of kids still around, even today. You know, I have a program at the hospital, and I bring in 800 students at a time. And I show them slides of what goes on in a major teaching hospital, a research hospital. And we talk about human potential. And at the end, I let them ask me questions. But sometimes I ask the questions. 
And I remember asking once, I said, how many of you can name for me five NBA players? Do you know virtually all the hands went up? I said, what about five NFL players? All the hands went up. Major League Baseball, all the hands went up. Rap singers, movie stars, all the hands went up. I said, who can name for me five Nobel Prize winners? Out of 800, 10 hands went up. I said, leave your hands up, because I'm going to call on one of you. All the hands went down. <laughs> now, what does that tell you? And then I said, well, you know, this is the information age, the age of technology. Who can tell me what a microprocessor is? Of course, they were weary by now. So only one young man raised his hand. I called on him. He probably stood up and he said, a microprocessor is a tiny processor. That was it. That was the extent of his knowledge, extremely superficial. And you know, that is really quite troubling. Because what are the implications of that kind of ignorance? You know, there was a survey some of you might be familiar with in the, in the 90s looking at the ability of eighth grade equivalents in 22 nations to solve so-called complex math and science problems. We were one of the 22 nations, and we came in number 21 of the 22. We barely beat out number 22. It was neck and neck. That's very serious. In the age of technology, the information age, we produce 70,000 engineers a year in this nation, 40% of whom are foreigners. China produces 400,000 engineers a year. You know, this is serious stuff when we're talking about the future and our role in the future. We need to begin to make adjustments. And we need to make them quite soon. We can't sit around just being enamored of sports and entertainment Probably shouldn't say that in University of Alabama, but, you know, I think you get it. I think we all get it. Because we are the pinnacle nation in the world right now. But we're not the first pinnacle nation. There have been other pinnacle nations before us. Ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome, Great Britain, France, Spain. Pinnacle nations, number one, no competition, going to be there forever they thought. Where are they now? What happened to each and every one of them? Basically the same thing. They became enamored of sports and entertainment. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. Turned a blind eye to political corruption. Lost their moral compass. And they went right down the tubes. Some people say that can't happen to the United States. But I think an honest assessment would demonstrate that it is already in the process of happening. And the real question is, can we be the first pinnacle nation to actually learn from those who preceded us and take corrective action? Or must we inexorably still go down the same destructive path? That is really the question. I personally believe that we can. And that was, that was the reason my wife and I wrote our latest book, America the Beautiful. We can, we can make a difference because we are different. This nation is the child of every other nation. Therefore, we should have the interest of every other nation at heart. We are the perfect ones to remain in a pinnacle position for that and a number of other reasons. But, you know, as far as our educational doldrums are concerned, you should know that this is not the way it's always been here. In fact, in 1831, when Alexis de Tocqueville came here to study America, because the Europeans were just fascinated with America, they said, here is a nation barely 50 years old which is already competing with us on virtually every level. That's impossible. How could a fledgling nation be doing that? So he wanted to come over here and dissect and see what the heck was going on over here. And while he was at it, he said, let me look at their school system. And he was blown away. 
to see that virtually anybody finishing the second grade was completely literate. I mean, he could go out and find a mountain man who could read the newspaper, who could have a, a, a decent political discussion with him. He'd never seen anything like that before. You know, go in to some of the museums and look at some of the letters written by people on the frontier in the Wild West. You would think a college professor had written those letters. You look at the vocabulary and the grammar, the way it was done. There was a lot more emphasis in times past. If you really want to be blown away, get a hold of a sixth grade exit exam from the 1830s. Uh, there, there are questions in America the Beautiful in the book from an exit exam from that time. See if you can pass that test. I doubt that most college graduates today could pass that test. We have dumbed things down to that level. Why is that so important? Because the founders of our nation made it very clear that for our type of government to succeed, it required a very well-informed and educated populace. They said without that, what will happen is that you will have ever-expanding government that will eventually take over the lives and the functions of the people. That's why it is so important, and it's not too late, for people to educate themselves, to actually know what's going on, so that you cannot be easily led by some pundit on television who tells you what you're supposed to think who you're supposed to like, who you're not supposed to like. We've reached a stage where a lot of people will go into the voting booth, and the only thing they're looking for is a name that looks familiar to them. They don't know anything about them. Oh, yeah, I know that name. Yeah, I'm vote for that one. That is irresponsible. That is not what the intention was. The intention was for the people to be very involved and very informed. And you look at how things have changed dramatically. The, the Founding Fathers were smart people, but they didn't anticipate everything. For instance, you know, they looked uh, at a, a system of government with an executive branch and a legislative branch and a judicial branch. Uh, and that comes from the book of Isaiah, by the way, uh, as did a lot of things in our government. It was a Judeo-Christian basis for the establishment of our government. But it worked very well the way that it was established. What they did not anticipate was a fourth branch of government, which we now have, which has grown very big and very powerful, and that's called special interests. And why did that occur? Well, the way it was initially set up, it was sacrifice to go into government. And therefore, it wasn't really anticipated that people would want to stay there for the rest of their lives. You know, they would go, serve, go back to their community, somebody else would come. But it's changed, and now people want to stay for their whole lives, and they need money in order to do that, and they have to establish relationships with powerful financial entities. And that cannot be done without quid pro quo. Hence, you have the establishment of another branch of government, which is very powerful and distorts the will of the people. I would go so far as to say virtually anything that, is, that makes no sense, it's because there's a special interest group behind it. Those are things that we, the people, are going to have to find ways to change. Well, at any rate, I will tell you, I did not remain the dummy in the class because my mother, with her third grade education, was determined that I would succeed and that my brother would succeed. She didn't know what to do. She prayed. She asked God to give her wisdom. What could she do to get her young sons to understand the importance of intellectual development? And you know what? God gave her the wisdom, at least in her opinion. My brother and I didn't think it was all that wise. 
I mean, turning off the TV, what kind of wisdom was that? You know, as far as we were concerned, it was child abuse. But she said we could watch only two or three TV programs during the week. And with all that spare time, we had to read two books apiece from the Detroit Public Libraries and submit to her written book reports, which she couldn't read, but we didn't know that. She would put little check marks and highlights and underlines, and we would think she was reading them, but she wasn't. But, you know, I was not very happy about this, as you might imagine, in the beginning. But you know, after, after a few weeks, I actually began to enjoy reading those books because we were desperately poor, but it didn't cost anything to go to the library. And between the pages of those books, I could go anywhere. I could be anybody. I could do anything. I would imagine myself conducting experiments. I began to know things that nobody else knew. Within the space of a year and a half, I went from the bottom of the class to the top of the class, much to the consternation of all those students who used to call me dummy. They were now coming to me saying, Benny, 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 how do you work this problem? And I'd say, sit at my feet, youngster, while I instruct you. I was, uh, I was perhaps a little obnoxious, but it sure felt good to say that to those turkeys. But, you know, the, the key thing was I had a very different impression at that time of who I was. And I had an insatiable appetite for knowledge. You know, you never saw me without a book. I, I went from being called dummy to being called bookworm. Even my mother would say, Benjamin, put the book down and eat your food. It didn't matter. I was always reading it. And what a tremendous difference it made. And it's, it's one of the reasons that, you know, my wife and I started the Carson Scholars Fund. You know, it has two aspects. And, and help yourself to go to the website, carsonscholars.org. I don't have really time to go much into it except to say that, you know, we would go into schools. And we'd see all these trophies, all state basketball, all state wrestling, all state this, that, and the other. What about the academic superstar? What did they get? Maybe a National Honor Society pen? Pat on the head, they're their little nerd, you know? Nobody really cared about them. They really never got much due. So we started trying to put them on the same kind of pedestal as the all state athletes, give them the same kind of recognition. But the other thing that we do is we put in reading rooms and all over the country because, you know, there are a lot of students who come from homes where there are no books. And then they go to a school where there's no library. And what are the chances of that individual loving to read? And we know there's a strong correlation between those who are able to read well and success in our society. And we have to make every effort that we can to change that fast. We can't just let it gradually change because we're under the gun right now. I made mention of, of that survey. There are other nations that are advancing much more quickly than we are. And we have to be incredibly serious about this and engaged. So I ask you, tonight, go to carsonscollege.org. Get involved, because we have to change this if we're going to survive as a pinnacle nation. You know, the other aspect of our scholarship fund, you know, in order to even be considered child has to have a 3.75 grade point average on a 4.0 scale. Most of them have 4.0. They're very, very smart kids. But they also have to demonstrate humanitarian qualities, that they care about other people. They can't win unless they have demonstrated that for more than just the six weeks before the application, too. I mean, it has to be sustained humanitarian activity. Why is that so important? Well. This nation is a humanitarian nation. Think about it. Anytime there's a disaster, who's first in line to give money, to give supplies? We are. And it's always been that way. You can even go back to the very earliest parts of our nation. You know, Europeans were looking at us, and they were saying, those Americans are just crazy. They said, I mean, look at the Fords and the Kelloggs and the Vanderbilts 
and the Carnegies and the Mellons and the Rockefellers, those people have enormous amounts of money and nobody else has any money. You can't have a system like that. That doesn't work. You need to have an overarching government that collects the money and redistributes the wealth in the way that it sees fit. In other words, the United States of America was responsible for socialism because we were the ones who inspired them to do that. But you know, they made one miscalculation. They assumed that those names that I just mentioned were like the rich people in their nations who just accumulated wealth into themselves and passed it down from generation to generation. But all of those names that I just mentioned poured enormous amounts of wealth back into infrastructure, into building factories, textile mills, created an environment that then spurred on the most prolific middle class the world had ever seen. They also created foundations, charitable organizations, schools, hospitals. That has been the nature of wealth in America. In 2009, 40 of the wealthiest families in America pledged to give away half of their wealth. Go to any country in Europe and ask the 40th wealthiest families to give away their half their wealth. They'll look at you like you got three heads. This is an American phenomenon. And it is very important that we do not extinguish it with class warfare. That is very detrimental, dividing people up in any way no matter who does it and for what purpose. That is not what allows strength to gather. A wise man once said, a house divided against itself can not stand. So when we start talking about fairness, what we need to do is all get together and ask ourselves, well, what is fair? In my opinion, God is fair. And what did God say? He said, I want to tithe. He didn't say, if you have a bumper crop, you owe me triple tithe. He didn't say, if your crops fell, you don't owe me anything. So there must be something very fair about proportionality. You make $10 billion, you give a billion. You make $10, you give one. Why is that complex? Well, some people say, well, but it didn't hurt the guy who gave a billion as much. Why do you need to hurt the guy? He just put a billion dollars in the pot. You don't need to hurt him. You know, I mean, it's that kind of thinking that has created 602 banks in the Cayman Islands. That's craziness. You know, and, and we, we need to just abandon that. What we do need to do, though, is make it a fair system where you don't have a bunch of loopholes and ways for people to get out of things. And, you know, it's time for us as a nation to sit down together and figure out how to get this done in a truly fair way, not picking one group and saying, we're going to do this for you, and picking another group, we're going to do this for you. That's really not fair. And that's really not the American way when we try to pit one group against another in order to gain political power. And these are all things that were talked about in detail by the founders of our nation which I hope you will, will get the new book and read it, because I put all the quotations in there. My wife did all the research. You know, this is not rewritten history. This is what actually happened. And that established a nation that is so special. And why do I think America is so special? For hundreds of years, for thousands of years, before America came on the scene, people did things the same way. Within 200 years of the establishment of this nation, men were walking on the moon. Completely changed the course of mankind and of the world. The thinking, the freedom, the entrepreneurship, the caring that established this nation. And we cannot allow that to disappear from us. Well, you would think that now that I'm a terrific student, everything was going to go well for me. Wrong. 
You see, when I got to high school, I ran into the worst thing a young person can run into. It's called peers. P-E-E-R-S. That stands for people who encourage errors, rudeness, and stupidity. <laughs> and that's what they were doing, telling you what kind of clothes you should wear and how you should, where you should be hanging out. And I got caught up in that stuff, and I went from an A student to a B student to a C student. I didn't care, because I was cool. And I wasted a whole year before my mother, again, was able to get me to understand that it wasn't what you wore on the outside, but it was what you had up here that made the difference. And I got back on the right track. And they didn't like it. And they were calling me nerd and Poindexter and Uncle Tom. But I would always shut them up by saying one thing. I'd say, let's see what I'm doing in 20 years. And let's see what you're doing in 20 years. And they must have believed me, because when I graduated from high school, they all voted me most likely to succeed. So that means that they knew what was necessary to succeed. They were too lazy and trifling to do it themselves. That's what negative peer pressure is. And unfortunately, it is not constricted to just high school. You'll find ne negative peer pressure in all aspects of your life. People trying to control your life, trying to control your behavior. You're abnormal. And we've got to learn to think for ourselves and to move forward you know, in a logical way and not in a political way. It will make all the difference in the world. But, you know, when I did get back on track, there was one thing, overriding thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to be a contestant on my favorite TV program, GE College Ball. Anybody remember GE College Ball? Oh, yeah, there are a few old people. Okay, I mean, that was my favorite TV program, it came on every Sunday at 6 o'clock. They pitted two colleges against each other. They'd ask questions about science, math, history, geography. And I was really good at all that stuff. But they also asked questions about classical art and classical music. There was no way you were going to learn classical art and classical music at Southwestern High School in inner city Detroit. I mean, in my high school, if you said Van Gogh, they would say, put gas in it, the van will go. They had no idea what you were talking about. So I just made an executive decision. I would get on the bus, go downtown to the Detroit Institute of Arts day after day, week after week, month after month, roam through those galleries until I knew every picture who painted them when they were born, when they died, what period it represented, listening to my portable radio, Bach, Telemann, Mozart. Kids in Detroit thought I was nuts. I mean, a black kid in Motown listening to Mozart? I tried to convince them that the Mo in Motown was Mozart, but nobody was buying it. And I even decided which college to attend based on college ball. I had enough money to apply to one college. I said, I'm going to apply to the college that wins the grand championship in college ball. Well, the grand championship that year was between Harvard and Yale. And Yale just demolished Harvard, so I didn't want to go to school with a bunch of dummies, so, you know, I probably offended somebody. But, you know, I applied to Yale, and fortunately, they accepted me with a scholarship. And the year I went there, however, was the year College Bowl went off the air, so I still didn't get to be on it. But it was okay, because, you know, years later, I decided I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. And I wanted to go to the place best known for neurosurgery. That, of course, was Johns Hopkins. Cushing, Dandy, Walker, all the biggest names. The problem was they only took two people a year out of 125 top applicants. How was I going to get to be one of them? Well, you know, when I went for my interview, the fellow who was in charge of the residency program, George Udrahai, was also in charge of cultural affairs at the hospital. And we talked a little bit about medicine and some about neurosurgery. Somehow the conversation turned to classical music. And we talked for over an hour about different conductors and their style, composers, orchestras, orchestral halls, it was, he was on cloud nine. There was no way he wasn't taking me in the program. And you know, some people used to criticize me when I was, when I was learning the classical art and the classical music. They said, you know, that's European history. That's not culturally relevant to you. But really, what does that term mean, cultural relevance, to a citizen? of the United States of America. Go to Ellis Island. Go through that museum. Look at the faces on the wall, those pictures of people who came to this nation from every part of the world, many of them with only the things they could carry. People who work not eight hours a day, but 10, 12, 16 hours a day, not five days a week, six or seven days a week. No such thing as a minimum wage, not for themselves that they work, but so that their sons and daughters, grandsons and granddaughters might have an opportunity in this land. That's what's culturally relevant. 
Hundreds of years before that, other immigrants came here in the bottom of slave ships, worked even longer, even harder for less. But they too had a dream that one day their great-grandsons, great-granddaughters might pursue freedom and prosperity in this nation. And of all the nations in the world, this one, the United States of America, is the only one big enough and great enough to allow all those people from all those backgrounds to achieve their dreams. And that's why every single one of us is culturally relevant to every single one of us. And that's why we're called the United States of America. And we would do well to recognize that our diversity is not a weakness. It is a tremendous blessing and a tremendous strength. You know, I was asked once by an NPR reporter, she said, Dr. Carson, I notice you don't speak very much about race. Why is that? I said, it's because I'm a neurosurgeon. And she looked at me quite quizzically, couldn't quite understand the correlation. I said, you see, when I take someone to the operating room and I cut that scalp and peel it down and take that bone off and open the dura, I'm operating on the thing that makes them who they are. I said, the cover doesn't make them who they are. It's the brain that makes them who they are. And when you begin to think on that kind of a level about things and not just knee-jerk reactions to superficial things, you become a different person. And that's why we have the kind of brain power that we have today. And when I began to realize all those things, I had a very, very rapid career. In no time I found myself chief of pediatric neurosurgery at the number one hospital in the nation. All kinds of fabulous things began to happen. Hemispherectomies, skeletal dysplasia cases, tumors, conjoined twins. And my star rose extremely rapidly. But I'm very, very grateful that I was born in this nation where you can make choices and where you have the ability through hard work to control your destiny, where you don't have to be a victim unless you choose to be a victim. And that's what I mean when I say think big. Each one of those letters means something special. The T is for talent, which God gave to every single person, not just the ability to sing and dance and throw a ball. Nothing wrong with that. I have nothing against sports and entertainment. But we need to elevate academic achievement to the appropriate level, and we got to do it quickly. I think we have one generation, no more than that, to fix this problem. We have to be serious. The H is for honesty, lead a clean and honest life. You don't put skeletons in the closet. You put them there, they always come back to haunt you, just when you don't want to see them. And if you always tell the truth, you don't have to try to remember what you said three months ago. The I is for insight, which comes from listening to people who are already going where you're trying to go. Learn from their triumphs. Learn from their mistakes. The N is for nice. Be nice to people. Because once they get over their suspicion of why you're being nice, they'll be nice to you. And if you're a Democrat, I want you to make sure you're nice to all Republicans for a week. And if you're a Republican, I want you to make sure you're nice to all Democrats for a week. And I want you to get used to doing that because we have to learn how to work together. We have much more in common than we have apart. And we need to understand what our principles are. What are the values? What do we stand for in this nation? not allow ourselves to be divided up by pundits who derive their power and their income by stirring up trouble among the people. We're smarter than that, and we can do better than that. The K is for knowledge, which is the thing that makes you into a more valuable person. Do I have a big house? Yes. A lot of cars? Yes. I grew up in Detroit. I like cars. Are they important? No. If they all disappear tomorrow, I don't care why, because I can get them all right back almost immediately with what's up here. Or at least I could before managed care. And that's what Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, meant when he said, gold, silver, and rubies are nice, but be treasured far above those knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, because with those you get all the gold and silver and rubies you want. More important, you come to understand they don't amount to a hill of beans. 
that the most important thing is developing your God-given talents to become valuable to the people around you. The B is for books, which is the mechanism for obtaining that knowledge. And you know, it's never too late. My mother did eventually teach herself to read, got her GED, went on to college in 1994, got an honorary doctorate degree, so she's Dr. Carson now too. So it's never too late. The second I is for in-depth learning, learning for the sake of knowledge and understanding. The last letter, G, is for God. We live in a country that is trying to throw God out. I think that is a tremendous mistake. Many of the people who have tried to rewrite our history say, our founding fathers didn't really believe in God. And not really, they were deist. That means a God who just put things in motion and then walked away. But if you read their writings, many of which are in our new book, you will see they were not deist. And I want you to think about this. Our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, talks about inalienable rights given to us by our Creator, a.k.a. God. The Pledge of Allegiance to our flag says we are one nation under God. Many courtrooms on the wall, it says, in God we trust. Every coin in your pocket, every bill in your wallet says, in God we trust. If it's in our founding documents, it's in our pledge, it's in our courts, and it's on our money, but we're not supposed to talk about it, what in the world is that? In medicine, we call it schizophrenia. And doesn't that explain a lot of what's going on in our nation today? And we may need to make it perfectly clear that it's okay to live by godly principles of loving your fellow man, of caring about your neighbor, of developing your God-given talents to the utmost so that you become valuable to the people around you, having values and principles that govern our lives. And if we do that, we will truly have one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we have an opportunity for a few questions. There are some roving uh, microphones, and we would like for you to use those so that everybody can hear the question. I see a hand right here. Hi. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Jessica Cooperberg. I'm a 2009 fellow from Seattle, Washington. Um, you were appointed in 2004 for the Bioethics Committee by President George W. Bush, and you spoke earlier about how the U.S. inspired socialism. Um, and I was wondering if you could take a second and talk about the ethical implications of universal health care and uh, what your opinions are on that. Okay. Well, there is no question that we need health care reform in this country. We spend more than twice as much per capita for health care in this country as the next closest nation. And yet we have tremendous access problems. And there's an enormous amount of waste and uh, inefficiency in our system. So that's not going to be corrected, quite frankly, by throwing more money at it. Uh, it is going to be corrected by doing intelligent things. For instance, you know, if, if you get an appendectomy in Birmingham, Alabama versus New York City versus Miami versus Los Angeles versus Detroit, different costs, different ways of submitting bills, different ways of collecting, all of which justifies the mountains and mountains of paper involved and the armies of people to push them around, all of whom have to be paid out of the health care dollar. That is absolutely craziness. When every single diagnosis has something known as the ICD-9 code, every procedure has something known as the CPT code, and we have computers, which means it can all be done electronic virtually instantly without all those papers and all those people to push them around. Now, special interest groups wouldn't like that because there's some special interest groups that benefit from all of that crap. And, um, you know, we have to be able to get through that and do things in an intelligent fashion. Now what I would do 
Um, because the, the, what the special interest groups say is some doctors would be unscrupulous and they would indicate they had done two appendectomies instead of one so they could get paid twice, get the money right away. Those of us in medicine know there are very few physicians who would do such a thing, but there are a few. And for those, instead of building a gigantic expensive bureaucracy, why not just employ what I call the Saudi Arabian solution? Why do people not steal very much in Saudi Arabia? You cut off their limbs. You cut off their fingers, you cut off whatever. Well, I wouldn't necessarily do that. But there would be some real penalties for doing it. I mean, you'd lose your license for life. You go to jail for no less than 10 years. You lose all your personal assets. I don't think anybody would even think about doing it. And, you know, as proof of that, you look at Sweden, who used to have a tremendous drunk driving problem. And then, you know, about 20 years ago, they enacted the most severe drunk driving penalties in the world, and it's uniformly applied, and there is virtually no drunk driving in Sweden. So, you know, there are ways to use penalties, but they have to be used across the board. You can't play favorites with them, and they have to be consistent, and the, that kind of behavior dies out very quickly. Also, you know, there, there, there are a lot of other solutions that, you know, I mentioned in, in the book, uh, America the Beautiful, uh, that really, I think, solve these problems quite effectively, get the cost down tremendously, and provide actually better access than we have now. So it can be done. I think we should do it. I think we can do it, and we can do it for even less if we do it in an intelligent and rational way. Yes. Um, She's coming with the microphone. I know, I know we talked a little bit earlier about music, but I never had the opportunity to ask you, what is your favorite classical piece? Oh boy, now that's a tough one, because I love so many uh, classical pieces of music. You know, my, my wife is a, a classical musician, and uh, uh, when we were at home on Friday nights, about this time I would be laying on the couch and she would be playing the piano. Uh, and it's just so soothing. But, you know, I primarily like Baroque music. And uh, I love Handel's Messiah. Uh, I could listen to that all day, every day. But, you know, what was interesting, um, some years ago, when we were separating the Banda twins, uh, in South Africa. Uh, these were uh, twins that are joined at the top of the head facing in opposite directions. And there had been 13 attempts to separate twins like that before, none of which had been successful. And um, we had embarked uh, upon this operation. It was extraordinarily difficult. And uh, we reached a point where the blood vessels were so gorged and entangled, we stopped the operation, decided to go in the conference. I suggested maybe we should just cover the area over with skin and come back in a few months and maybe they will have developed enough collaterals that we could cut through. And the doctors from Zambia and South Africa said, we don't have the ability to keep partially separated twins alive, they'll die. And now I really felt the weight of the world on my shoulders and, and I just said, Lord, it's up to you. And I went in there with my scalpel, my loops, and a prayer on my lips started cutting between those vessels that were so thin you could see the anesthetic bubbles coursing through them, just daring you to make a nick in them. Make a long story short, when I made the final cut that separated those twins, over the stereo system came the hallelujah chorus. And everybody had goosebumps. And when we finished that operation, after 28 hours, one of the twins popped his eyes open, reached for the endotracheal tube. The other one did the same thing by the time we got to the ICU. Within two days, they were extubated. Within three days, they were eating. Within two weeks, they were crawling. And today, they're thriving in the eighth grade and doing very well. Another question. Yes. Dr. Carson, based upon some of the things you were discussing with politics and American government, it sounds like you'd be in favor of implementing term limits and some other changes in Washington. Can you discuss that? Well, uh, yes, I would very much be in favor of term limits. Uh, fully recognizing the argument that 
you know, if people only have a couple of years to serve, they never really get to know the system and their usefulness is limited. I, and I understand that and I appreciate that. And what I would do to solve that problem is give people longer terms. You know, I'd make the term, you know, six, eight, even 10 years. But you can't be reelected. You just have the one term. You can be recalled. I'd give people the possibility of recalling every two years. But you can't be reelected. And that would be a severe blow to, uh, to the fourth branch of government. And I really think that's the only way we're going to get it done. Now, how's that going to happen when the people in Congress are the ones who get to vote on that? Uh, it, it's, I'm going to say something very radical right now. It's going to require a constitutional convention. Just like we used to have back in the early days. That's what it's going to take because things have gotten so far out of whack that it needs to be readjusted. And it's got to be readjusted before it's too late. Any other? Yes. Young lady. And by the way, for those who don't know, we have some young people here from Restoration Academy, which uh, takes uh, young people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds and uh, really tries to prepare them for the world. And you'll see from, if you talk to some of these young people, that they're doing a tre tremendous job. Where does your brother Curtis live? Uh, my brother uh, lives in the Atlanta area. And uh, he is uh, an aeronautical and mechanical engineer. Works for uh, Parker Aviation. So uh, I became the brain surgeon, he became the rocket scientist. <laughs> I see a couple of hands over here. Hey, you spoke a little bit earlier about the victim's mentality. What steps or actions can we take as a society to uh, try to change that culture? Okay, uh, good question. How can, how can we eradicate the victim's mentality? Well, first of all, I think we, we have to continue to manifest the compassion that has always been a part of who we are. Sometimes, you know, we even have to go above and beyond what we want to do. You know, in medicine, for instance, uh, some of you who are older remember, you never used to hear very much about indigent people not getting medical care. Uh, is it because there were no indigent people? No. It was because uh, many years ago, insurance companies didn't uh, didn't have the ability to run roughshod over everybody. And, you know, they had to pay a decent amount when you saw a patient who was insured so that physicians had somewhat of a cushion and virtually all of them included a substantial number of indigent people in their practice. And nobody said boo about it. It was just something you did and something that was expected of you. And uh, now they don't have the ability to do that because they run on such margins. But, you know, people have to find ways to do that anyway, to get these people taken care of. Um, victim's mentality is something that is stoked by many in the political arena in order to increase their own power. They want people to be dependent. They want people to be victims so that they can look to them as their great savior and so that they can vote for them and keep them in power. It's exactly the wrong course of action to take. And we need to hold up in front of people uh, good examples. For instance, there is an organization known as the Horatio Alger Society. Uh, they select 10 to 12 people each year and these are people who came from horrible, horrible backgrounds and have achieved at the highest levels in our society. Those stories need to be out there. That's what Horatio Alger used to write about. Famous American writer, rags to riches stories. Uh, and we need to help people to understand that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you is you. It's not somebody else. And see, that's that's where you become a victim when you start thinking that somebody else 
is con in control of your destiny. And that simply is not the case when you live in a free country. And we have to make sure it remains a free country because, you know, it's getting more and more regulated and becoming less and less free. But that's because the people have shrunken back. And when the people shrink back, something has to fill that void and it becomes government. The people have got to become more vocal. No question about it. You spoke about politics in the library and actually just took a new job working in the library, but I wanted you to talk about the politics of a library because most public libraries are funded by city and county governments and the trend in funding, as you said, you know, it's exposing people to stuff that they don't have, which a library does. Can you share some thoughts about that and the, the trend of funding towards those institutions? Okay, well, I can tell you that, uh, what night were we at the library, Candy? Tuesday night of this week. Uh, we were at the main branch of the Baltimore Library. Uh, it was actually a, a thank you uh, for Candy and myself and some other uh, philanthropists in the Baltimore area who had done a lot for the library system. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is because libraries are so important, we shouldn't depend on the government. You know, we should take care of our own libraries and our own communities. Uh, people should get involved uh, in, in, in something that can have such a profound effect on the young people. We gotta stop depending on the government to do everything. We can do this ourselves. And if you go back to early America, where we had a large number of libraries established, they were maintained by the communities. We need to get back to doing that again. I think that's where we will have very successful libraries. And, and, and while I'm on that topic, churches. Why are churches tax exempt? Because they're supposed to be doing stuff in their communities. They're not supposed to be social clubs. And now we have a situation where the government is competing with the churches and still giving the churches tax exemption. So let's stop being schizophrenic about it. Either don't give the churches any exemptions or let the churches do their jobs. And I think uh, if, if we get more people involved in communities like they used to be and caring about each other, a whole lot of these problems get taken care of and we can leave the government to do what the government's supposed to do. I see a hand over here. And uh, how many more questions can we take? About two more. Two more, okay. Um, I know that um, universities, um, engineering colleges, they are working on um, technologies to help with surgeries. Um, how do you feel about the impact of technology in the medical field? Uh, I have seen neurosurgery change tremendously on the basis of technology in the decades that I've been in the field. And it's about to take another giant leap. Uh, now we have tremendous imaging, but very soon we will have robots. There are already robots working in some areas of surgery. Uh, they're not quite refined enough to do neurosurgery yet, but that's just a matter of time. And when they are, the kinds of things that we will be able to do will be absolutely astonishing. And, uh, you know, I'll be too old, but I'll still be watching with great anticipation and, uh, and making a few suggestions about it. It's very exciting. And uh, one last question. I'll let the people with the microphone make the choice so I won't be the bad guy. Hi. Um, after teaching school across the street from Benjamin S. Carson Honors Preparatory in Atlanta for three years, I happened across Gifted Hands and um, read it and enjoyed it and haven't read your most recent book, but it sounds like the two have uh, taken on very different tones. And I'm curious if politics are in your future now or where you're going from here. Well, there have been a lot of people who've tried to convince me that I should go into politics, but until the hand of God grabs me and puts me in that arena, I will not do it. Uh, but 
I think there have to be some voices that cry in the wilderness uh, to, to help wake people up. Uh, we're devoting, Candy and I, a lot of our energy to education because we recognize that ultimately if our nation is to succeed, then we must be at the top and not at the bottom of the academic pile. So I think that's every bit as important as anything I could possibly do uh, in the political arena. This young man has the last question. Okay. Um, what it was your hardest surgery? Oh boy. What was my hardest? There were so many that were so hard. You know, I spent a lot of time praying. I might have looked like I was operating. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but one that comes to mind uh, is, is actually he was an adult. His wife was uh, a nurse on the pediatric neurosurgery service, so I could not escape her. And, uh, you know, he had something called Van Hippel Lindau. Uh, a genetic disorder that involves tumors that develop in different parts of the central nervous system. And it turns out that he developed one of these tumors in the middle of his brain stem. And uh, no one on the adult side could come up with a solution. And his wife, you know, had been working with me for years and she says, well, you do all these amazing things. You can operate on my husband. I said, but he's not a kid. And she says, he's a kid at heart. And uh, so, you know, I talked to him and I, I said, you know, there's a 50-50 chance that you will die on the table if we try to take that tumor out. And he said something re relatively profound. He said, there's a 100% chance that I'm going to die if you don't take it out. So I'll go with the 50. During that operation, which was very, very difficult, the evoked potentials. These are like the electric waves. So like you have one for the heart, you have one for the brain. They went flat. The anesthesiologist who was not in favor of the operation in the first place said, see that? You killed him. Well, I wasn't happy, but we did get the tumor out. And uh, we closed them up. We were rather somber. And the next morning, he was awake and cracking jokes. He did perfectly fine. But I don't necessarily believe that some of those cases are all me. I always pray and I ask God to help me. I ask him to give me wisdom. And I, he never let me down. And that's one of the reasons that my faith is so strong. All right, well, thank you all very much. For more information about Ben Carson, 